All right, well, welcome. Uh, go ahead, everybody grab it. Wait, no, that's what I always say. I assume you're already sitting. I assume that you've already got your Bibles. If you don't have your Bibles, just pause right now. Go get it, we'll wait, it's fine. Wow, that took a long time. Okay, is everybody ready to go? What I need you to have with you is I need you to have your Bible with you. I need you to have a writing stick, something to write with, and I need you to have a notepad. One of the things that is gonna be a little bit different when we go today is I'm not gonna be able to hear your questions. I'm not gonna be able to interact with you. And as you all well know, I am super distractible. So that's gonna be a little bit difficult for me. So I'm gonna plow right in. We're gonna start reading from God's word. We're gonna start understanding kind of where we're at reminding ourselves a little bit of where Peter was going in this thread because it's been a few weeks and we've had a lot happen. So that's what I need you to have, your Bible, a notebook, and we'll get started. So to begin, we're headed to book of 1 Peter. That's where we've been over and over again. We're headed to chapter four because it comes after chapter three. We're gonna start out in verses 10 and I'm hoping we'll get to verse 11 today, but I make no promises. So. Where we left off, don't forget, Peter is writing this book to believers. He's writing it to exiles, to people who he knows are headed into great suffering. So the overall theme of this book is encouragement for believers. And also, when we say the word encouragement, we always remember that it kind of has with it this idea of strengthening or building people up so that they will be ready to face the challenges that are in front of them. So that's the overall context of the book. Remember, he's moving through, and the argument that he just got finished with, starting about in the middle of chapter three, is looking to Christ, who walked through suffering before us, as an example for how we should walk through suffering. And it is, I think it's important for us to just pause and remember that component because he's going to get to that here again when we get to the end of verse 11. He's going to kind of, he started drawing that line starting in the middle of chapter three. He's working it through all of these different points about how Christ's suffering leads us towards uh, dispensing God's grace to other believers, how it leads us towards hospitality, how it leads us towards the ability to share the gospel, the life-giving gospel with people. And he's going to bring that back around to this big idea of God's glory. And so we're going to start off, I'm actually going to start off in chapter 4, starting in verse 7, because that's kind of the beginning of Peter's thought as we move through this text. So go ahead, look in 1 Peter chapter 4, starting in verse 7. As we're going through, one of the things that I would ask you to do is if you have a question, you've got your notebook with you, scratch that question out on your, on your notebook so that you don't forget it as we move through because we really wanna be able to capture those things that make us wonder as we're moving through a text so that we can go back and study those out later. Now, hopefully by the time we're done, we'll be able to see how Peter has put all these pieces back together for us, but it's always a good idea to be able to capture those questions as we're moving through. So, 1 Peter chapter 4, starting in verse 7, he starts right off at the end. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. So, we're remembering now that he is the big idea is that the end of all things is near, that there will be a final ending to these things that he's been writing about, that there's kind of a summing up, there's a closing up of all things, and that's coming. And Peter's trying to prepare people mentally and spiritually for what's coming. So that sets the, the urgency that's in his voice. It's almost as if he is worried for the people that he's talking to because he can see this big closing up of the pages of history coming. And, he's, and so he wants them to have these characteristics. He wants them to have sound judgment. He wants them to think clearly and wisely. He wants them to be sober in the spirit for the purpose of prayer. There to be people who are oriented towards prayer. He wants them to love one another. And he's going to bring that theme out and, and really break it down here when we get to verse 10. And this idea of being hospitable with one another. We talked about that last week. What does it mean to be hospitable? 
What does it mean to give of yourself so that other people are comfortable and taken care of and cared for? But he's going to break open a big idea here and start to tie these loose ends when we get into verse 10. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good servants of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks, it is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves it serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength with God, which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion and forever and ever. Amen. So he starts off, remember, he started this ball rolling saying, the end of all things is near. Be sober, be wise, be prayerful, be hospitable to one another, love one another. So there's this big thing rolling forward and we get to the end and he, it's almost like he's singing. It's almost like he's kind of changed into a prayer by the time he gets to the end. And you'll see that when he says, Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. That sounds a lot like a prayer because I think he kind of turns the corner as we're moving through these verses. So what makes him do that? Let's look in verse 10 because in verse 10, there's some big ideas that are going to drive us through the rest of this passage. As each one has received a special gift. So key point number one, each one of us, has a special gift. Now, who is the each one in that? It's believers, right? He's writing to believers. So when we talk about the each one who has been given a special gift, he's talking specifically about believers. Now, we won't dive deep into the idea of gifts. We've done that in the past when we've looked at the uh, idea of spiritual gifts and things like that. But for right now, gifts are special or supernatural, if you will, things that God has given to individual believers to allow them to do a couple of things. And he's going to list those things out here in the next passage. But for right now, this idea of a gift, we all know what gifts are, right? We all know what presents are. They're things that you are given. It's not something you've earned. There's something that is an unearned benefit that's given to you. If you uh, got to your birthday party and I sat down at the table and there's a cake in front of you and you blow out all the candles and it's present time and they took you into the room that had all the presents in it and there was nothing in it. And then you turn to your parents and you're like, what gives here? What's going on? And they said, well, I'm sorry, you haven't earned any of your presents this year. That's the opposite of what we're looking at. We're looking at the idea that a present is something that you don't work to receive. Now, the idea of a spiritual gift here, we're going to put it in context because it's really easy to become laser focused on this idea of a gift because we all like to get them. But that's not the main idea. So let's keep going through verse 10. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. There's a lot of ideas packed into this sentence, so let's kind of start to take them apart. We're going to start actually at the end, because the big idea in this passage is the grace of God. That's the big idea in this passage. One of the things that comes from the grace of God are gifts. Now, it's not the only thing that comes from the grace of God. There are lots of things that fall into that category of the grace of God. Things that God gives us that we don't deserve. Certainly our supernatural spiritual abilities are one of those things. But think for a minute, what are some of the other things that God gives us as unearned favors that we would call grace? We've looked earlier in the chapter. He gives us I mean, think all the way back to chapter one when we talk about the fact that we are adopted into God's family. That is a gift, that we are inheritors of the things that God has given us. That's a gift, that our inheritance is guarded in heaven by God, and we are guarded, in and we are guarded on earth, that we're protected by God's favor. The fact that Christ came and walked on the earth, all of those things are, are graces, are gifts that God has given us. One of those things are these spiritual gifts. Now, we have to ask the why question, right? So the grace of God, 
one of the outworkings of the manifold grace of God, and not the only one, is our gifts. Where do those gifts go? Those gifts go to serve others, right? So it's not a gift that I get and I just keep. It's not a special talent or a special ability that I get. Maybe I'm very good musically. Maybe I have the gift of kind of of wise words in talking with my friends. Maybe I have the gift to, to understand spiritual things in a way that is a lot faster for me than for other people as they work through that. There's lots of different kinds of gifts that we're given, but they aren't gifts that are given just for my own benefit. If I'm very musically talented, that's not so I can just show off and have everybody look at me and say, hey, isn't, that, isn't he a great ukulele player? I'm not a great ukulele player. I'm not a ukulele player at all. Look at these hands. I can't play anything. But I know that the gifts that God gives to me by his own sovereign grace is for the benefit of others. And so be thinking about that. Hopefully this is something that we can think about as we're moving through this passage. If every believer has been given a gift, and if those gifts are intended for the service, as he says in verse 10, of one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God, what is it that God has given me that I can use to build up and serve others? I think it's a worthwhile question because it's really easy for us to say, I don't know. I don't know what I'm good at. I'm, I'm kind of good at math. Or I really like science or I'm super great at hacky sack or whatever your particular talent is. But God has given you a specific gift for the building up of other people within the body. So keep that in the back of your mind as we move through this process that the goal is the grace of God gives us gifts so that we have the ability to serve others. So this is how this progression goes. The big idea is God's grace. The means that God sometimes uses to pour his grace out on people is our gifts, and the intent of those gifts is to serve others. Now, think about this for a minute. How many times have you thought about the grace of God or asked for God's favor, or asked for something of God, and you're one of these people here, and you think, well, I, I'm just gonna reach straight up to God, and I'm gonna ask God if he will meet my need in some way. And that's not wrong. We are called to be people who pray and continue on in an attitude of prayer. But sometimes, he uses the people who he has given gifts to, to meet that need that we have. So that's one of the things we need to be open to, both as givers, well, I guess these are the recipients, right? These are the people who have received the gift, but then give that service to other people, and also the people who need help sometimes. So those are both ideas that we need to kind of keep and hold in our brain at the same time. Now, let's break down, because he breaks them into two categories for us here in the next verse. Uh, let each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks, it is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength with, God, with which God supplies. So he breaks it into two categories for us here, right? Speaking and serving. And this is the idea that I think we need to play around with. Because he makes it sound as though there's kind of two totally separate ways of serving. You have a way of like serving physically to people and a way of talking to people. And I think that's true. And I think he does make an appropriate distinction there. But one of the things I think we always need to think about is this. How often do you serve someone and not also speak with them? How often do you speak with someone and not also in some way serve with them? So if we're thinking about it, this is the way I tend to think about this because they both fall under this big category of special gifts given because of God's grace to, for the service of people. And he kind of puts it into two categories that overlap a little bit. So we have service and we have speaking. And there's a lot of overlap in between, right? Or there can be. 
Now you can certainly, and everybody can do it, you can certainly think about ways that you can serve people in a way that you don't ever actually talk to them. And you can think about ways that you talk to people and don't actually meet their physical needs. Most of the time, it's a little mix of both. It's a little mix of when you're helping that neighbor across the street shovel her driveway because she's 89 years old and she comes out and she says, oh, you're such a good kid. I, you know, I like you. You're not like those other rotten kids who get on my lawn. Whatever she ends up saying to you, you have the ability to speak words to her or you have the ability to speak words to your friend. Now, here's the hiccup. What are those words? So specifically for this idea of speaking, there's a, a constraint here, right? That I'm not just gonna be good at talking to people. I'm not just gonna be good at encouraging people. I'm not just gonna have the right words to say at the right time. Like we can all think of times when we haven't had the right words to say at the right time. Like somebody said something to you and then like 10 minutes later, you're like, oh, I should have said something else. But that happens to everybody, right? Well, this isn't just having the right words. Let's look and see what he says about the character of the words or the nature of the words that are used here. Whoever speaks is to do as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Now, does that mean when your friend comes up to you and says, man, I had a rough day, I fought with my other friend, I got in trouble with my parents, I failed my test, and you just turn to them and say, don't worry, all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. That's, it's true. And I don't diminish the fact, but that is sometimes not what people need to hear at that point. It's not just simply parroting the things that we've heard out of scripture. It's actually understanding how the different pieces of scripture work together the intent of the author, all the things that we talk about all the time, right? Would it be appropriate for, for this friend who's going through some kind of suffering, maybe they're being teased at school, maybe they're being teased at school because they don't make the same kinds of choices that other people make. Maybe it's because they're a believer. Maybe it's because they have a different set of values. Maybe it's because their heart's set on heavenly things and they're getting teased about it and mocked and things like that. Maybe that's what's going on. Would it be better to point them to some of the passages that we've gone through in this book, understanding how God uses suffering, or maybe pointing back to James, where he talks about, count it all joy, my brothers, as you encounter various trials, and then walk them through those ideas that God has put into scripture. Because those are, it's helpful for a person. The thing that we have to be careful of is when we're speaking, it's really easy for me to say things that I think are smart or funny or kind or wise or whatever, but those are my words. The controlling factor needs to be, what does God say about this situation? And that sometimes can be very difficult for people to hear. That's the other thing that we have to recognize is that sometimes in serving people, we are telling them things that God has outlined in scripture that will be hard for them to hear and that they won't appreciate hearing. But we hold true to this idea that the words that God wrote down in Scripture are useful in every situation in life. Now, maybe not every word is useful in every situation. That would be a big lift. But the principles that God has put into His Word apply universally to all people throughout all times and in all situations. And understanding how to use this book well allows us to speak as if we were uttering the very utterances of God. Not that we're prophets or not that we speak in prophecies or anything like that or have visions or anything like that, but if you understand God's word, you're able to encourage people, you're able to rebuke people, you're able to exhort people, you're able to do all the things that scripture does because you're walking in the power of God's word. So. That's the speaking side. So there's a constraint here is that speaking has to be God's speech. So God's speaking. Now, what's the constraint with service? Service is anything from raking leaves. It could be maybe you're on servant staff at camp. Maybe you're working in the nursery. Maybe you're working at VBS. Uh, if you're in the sound booth right now, I've got 
Two gentlemen who are helping me with the camera, that certainly qualifies as acts of service. There's lots of people who are doing things all the time for the care, building up, and serving one another within the body. That's a great thing. But the question is, what is the constraint that's on these acts of service? There's a constraint on my speaking. I can't be speaking what Mike thinks is really smart. I have to be speaking God's words. And when we look at how we have acts of service, in verse 11, after the semicolon, whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength with which God supplies. Again, our service is grounded in the power that God supplies. So our, our words are God's words. Our service is through the power of God. And you start to see what the big idea of this passage is, right? That our gifts, which is the thing we first keyed in on, because we love to get gifts, my gifts exist for the grace of God. The grace of God poured out gifts on believers. Those gifts go to serve others. We're going to close up this particular loop in just a second. But the nature of those gifts is I serve in the power that God supplies, and the words that I utter are God's words. So we start to see a real common theme here, right? God's service, God's words, God's glory. These are God's gifts to us. These are God's people that we're serving. Do you see what the big idea is here? Let's finish it out. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who speaks the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength with God supplies, so that in all things, in all things, in our words, in our actions, God may be glorified. And we could stop there, right? That closes up. So the, the result of the service to others is God's glory. O-R-Y. You're going to make fun of me for my spelling. I know already. But the end of all this is God's glory. We start to see that this is the thing that God has been concerned about from the very beginning, right? God is always concerned with his glory, that we rightly understand who he is and how valuable he is. So the gift that God gives to us are these spiritual gifts. We can serve others through God's power using God's word for God's glory, and we could cut it off right there, right? And you're like, no, there's still half of a verse left. Right, so let's figure out what he's doing here, because don't forget where we started. Our example in suffering is Jesus Christ. Our example that started us down this whole road is the fact that Christ suffers and he is our example and we look to him for strength, encouragement, guidance, and wisdom. So as we finish out this verse, in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ to whom belongs glory and dominion forever and ever. That should sound familiar, right? I hope that it sounds familiar because it, we're just gonna flip back to 315. Flip, go ahead, flip back to 315. I'll wait, no, it's fine. Okay, 315. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account of the hope that's within you, yet with gentleness and reverence. The idea there is sanctify Christ as Lord. And so when we get to the, this section in verse four, Jesus Christ, to whom belongs glory and dominion forever and ever. That dominion is a ruling ability. So Christ is an element of the glorification of God because Christ is our example in using our gifts. Christ is an example in serving others. And Christ's goal is to give glory to the Father, right? He doesn't exercise his own will, but he does the will of his Father. And you can see very easily how Peter gets to the end of this and he, where he started off giving them a warning, saying the end of all things is near. He gets to the end and he realizes this is a beautiful thing. 
This is all about God's glory and how God worked forward his plan for the redemption of humankind through Christ with the intent being that we are a part of it, using our gifts that he has given us to minister to other people that he has given us in the strength that he has given us and using the words that he has given us. And the end result is his glory. I hope as you look at this passage and think about it and meditate on it, this is what I hope. I hope that in your notebook, on your notepad, on the back leaf of your Bible, spend some time right now, think about those gifts that God has given you for the building up of other believers in the body because it brings God great glory when you use your gifts and glorify Him in the way that He's designed you to work. That's one of the beautiful things about this is even things like raking up somebody's leaves or unclogging somebody's toilet or going and helping paint their house or maybe watching little kids as as they're running around and playing games. All those things we do to the glory of God because that is the way he designed us to operate as believers. So thanks everybody. I hope that this was helpful to you. Um, Let me know in the comments if you have any questions, shoot me an email or text one of your small leaders if you've got a question or if you just wanna make time to meet. So we'll see you again soon.